<laughs> oh man. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Or welcome first time. I don't know uh, what you're viewing and has been in the past or uh, if you've been listening, but welcome. Hey, uh, this is All Over VoiceOver with Kip VH. And I'm so excited to uh, to welcome an old friend into the room, uh, Amy Rubinate. Amy, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. We we met. It was uh, I it was it was a Hope Levy workshop, right? Yeah. Or was I'm trying to remember if it was Pat Fraley or if it was Hope Levy. I think it was Hope. Actually, it was Hope. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And it was I, I want to say it was my first year in town, and and you were doing Mine too. Yeah. No kidding. Mm-hmm. I think we hit town about the same time. I think so. Yeah. That's wild. I came down from San Francisco, where I was a voice actor up there. And oh no, you kidding. Were from Chicago, right? Yeah, I came yeah. by way of Chicago. That's yeah. right. What, what what kind of stuff are you doing in San Francisco? I did a lot of toys and interactive. I was the voice of Tad for Leapfrog for many years, about 10 years until I moved. And I inherited that from a boy who went through puberty and they were like, forget it. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They were like, forget it. We're hiring a woman. <laughs> so I did that for a long time for the toys and uh, their toys and games line. Um, he was like the, their littlest frog. Okay. And it was kind of my bread and butter job. And then I branched out and did a, a lot of video games. I did. I don't know, maybe like 25 video games in about a year and a half. Did wow. a lot of Sega. Um, oh, just, you know, a lot of really fun stuff. And they really worked me. Like I did a ton of characters. I did like an angry 17-year-old boy, a robot. Yeah. You know, like, I don't know, evil queens that take over the universe. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All that fun stuff. Yeah. What a and then guess. I worked for Blizzard when I came to, t- you know, down to L.A. And, okay. Um, so that was kind of my, that was my wheelhouse up there i did commercials in that too but my, sure. my real thing was like you know the animation characters character. and animation yeah, that kind of stuff yeah that's great i had a good time <laughs> and then and then you started making this transition into into audiobooks yeah what um and uh and you introduced me to dan audio or dan dion yeah. dion audio yeah. and uh you know and i've done several books for them and they're just a wonderful yeah. company and i knew and, you had great shops for audiobooks thank yeah. you so much <laughs> I'm glad I, that kind it was, of canned out for you. It's been yeah. wonderful. I've really enjoyed it. I haven't done a ton of it, but but I I really love it. I love the yeah. I love the time that gets invested in it and the process mm-hmm. and the education of learning about these different topics that are so varied and unique. I I like playing all the characters. Oh man. <laughs> you get to play everyone. It's so satisfying. <laughs> yeah. It's really really fun. Yeah. What was what was the first uh, book that you did? First book I did was for Dan Musselman um, at Random House, mm. and it was A Faraway Island by Annika Thor, and it was a, a translation into English, and um, it was a middle grade book, which is what I really wanted to do. I had this whole sort of cast of characters that I've been working for years and, yeah. and all the work that I'd done, and I knew that I was a really good fit for children's um, and young adult books okay. um, because I, I had that voice, I had that style, I had all, you know, done all of that character work, and that was sort of the sensibility that I, I sort of live in, yeah. <laughs> and so that I, I, I read those books for fun. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm one of those grown-ups who reads YA in middle grade. Um, <laughs> so it was a perfect starting point, and in fact, I framed myself when I started out um, as, as someone who specialized in that, because I'd done a whole line of books for Leapfrog. I did a really great line. It was like Fancy Nancy, Click Clack Moo, Where the Wild Things Are, you know, really good. St- oh, Dr. Seuss book. We did, wow. um, <clears throat> yeah, The Cat in the Hat. And sometimes I narrated, sometimes I played different characters, sometimes I sang. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. And, and so I thought, well, this is a way that I can stand out from the crowd of middle-aged women doing romance, <laughs> which I now am. <laughs> now my bread and butter is a lot of, you know, <laughs> uh, doing romance. But, but I thought there's so many people doing that. What do I have to offer this industry that is different, hmm. that is unique to me, that mm-hmm. is my, you know, best foot forward, yeah. um, the skill set that I have that not that many people do. Hmm. And I knew that that strategy had paid off when I, a, a casting director offered me my first job and he said, Oh, you're the girl who does young adult. Huh? And I thought, Oh, wow, that really worked. <laughs> wow. And then about a year later, I had, you know, done really well. And I'd gotten a bunch of awards and, and reviews and things like that. And my career was rolling. And I had a meeting with um, a producer and I said, would you consider now seeing me as a woman? Mm. And she said, yes. And she gave me the missing James M. Cain book. 
he's the one that wrote Double Indemnity and yeah. you know, so many great films and books. Oh my he God. He had a lost book and it was discovered by like his estate. Um, and it needed a female, a young female protagonist. And she gave me this book and it was reviewed in the New York Times, well reviewed in the New York Times. And that was my shift into then doing adult fiction as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's been just a really interesting process that I found fascinating from a marketing point of view as well as an artistic point of view. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Of uh, figuring out exactly where you fit within that marketplace yeah. and branding yourself in a certain way. And, and then, then being to able to, out. and then how yeah. to branch out and go beyond that. Mm -hmm. How did you, how did you find <laughs> yourself in, well, let me, let me back up before uh, we, we, I, I, Cut to you in San Francisco doing oh, yeah. cartoons, and then I, I doing took animation that answer and, like took off with it. Yeah. <laughs> Just looking for my water. Where where, where, uh, where are you from originally? I am from Weaverville, California. Weaverville, California. It's a little gold rush community um, between Redding and Eureka on Highway 299 in what's known as the Trinity Alps. There is um, huge acres of, of wilderness. Um, uh, Shangri La was apparently based on Weaverville. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And so <laughs> it was a great place to grow up. Not a lot of professional acting there. So I, yeah. I ended up moving to San Francisco. I did a lot of cabaret there and then um, found voiceover, then moved to L.A. and became an audiobook narrator. That's amazing. That's great. Yeah. How did you make the transition into audiobook? Was it, was it a uh, – was it out of interest or like the, I know the way I stumbled on yeah. it was like, hey, man, listen, I, I, I I'm enough of a of a generalist that I want to get myself into as many different things as I can yeah. just to increase shots on goal. You know what I mean? Is, well, and it's a motivated? great way to make a living as an actor as well. Hmm. So, you know, it's it's if, if you end up in that sort of stream, um, it's steady income, it's good income and yeah. it's wonderful, wonderful, fulfilling work. I'm hmm. acting every single day, yeah. which is, you know, what we all set out to do, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. <laughs> but so when I came to, um, right before I came to LA, um, I became an avid audiobook listener. Ah. I was a huge fan. I listened a lot to, you know, Scott Brick and yeah. Simon Vance and Rosalind Lander, all the greats, Cassandra Campbell. Mm. Um, and I just really fell in love with the genre. I was in San Francisco, I was going to Emeryville twice a week for Leapfrog. I was going to, you know, I was going from San Rafael to San Jose, you know, yeah. which is sort of like going from Sherman Oaks to Long Beach, you know. Oh, geez. And I spent a lot of time in my car. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was sort of horrible. The traffic is pretty bad up there, even though. Nobody will agree to that down here. <laughs> bad. And right. um, I was miserable, you know, on the drive. And I started listening to audiobooks and my whole life changed. Huh. I I was peaceful. I was happy. I looked forward to getting into my car. So the gigs were wonderful and fulfilling. You know, I'd call my husband from the parking lot and be like, I just got paid to sing. She'll be coming around the mountain, you know, <laughs> as a two-year-old duck, you know. <laughs> so, but but the, the, the process of, you know, just getting around the barrier was horrible. Mm. So suddenly I was at peace. I was happy. I was reading all the time. Yeah. And anyone who tells you that listening isn't reading is wrong. You are inside the, the world of the book. Yeah. You know, you're eating those words. Yeah. And, um... And, and so it was such a wonderful genre. And I just started, you know, thinking, Oh, wait a minute. Okay. So I have a degree uh -huh. in speech communication with an emphasis in oral interpretation of literature. It took me 10 years to figure out that I should be an audiobook <laughs> narrator. <laughs> when did you make that realization where you're sitting there I'm looking slow. at, looking yeah. at your resume going, wait a second. I'm supposed to be doing this work. It my you soul know? knew it when I was in college. My soul knew it. Yeah. And I remember even when I was a kid, like, you know, they say, who wants to read aloud? You know, uh -huh. a hand shoots up, you know, and um, I and so I don't know at what moment it happened, but I found Pat Fraley's class yeah. and I it was a lot more money than I had at the time. And I just said, I'm going to do this. I, and it, it really was a soul thing. It was like, my heart was drawing me to this work. Yeah. And so I took myself to LA and I stayed at a sleazy motel. <laughs> <laughs> I went to his two day class and, yeah. and, um, right about that time, Scott Brick, um, who is just, you know, the king uh, of audiobooks, just so and, amazing. And the nicest man. I, I really, yeah. really love Scott. 
he's really mentored me in this business. Wonderful. And he he was uh, celebrating um, ten years of being an audiobook narrator, mm. and he decided to give back. And so he held a contest, and um, it was um, for anyone you know new audiobook narrators, and I think four hundred something of us. Um, you know, sent in. And again, it was that, it was the first moment of my branding myself. I said, how do I stand out in a sea of middle-aged woman doing romance? Yeah. And so I sent in a very young, yet peppy, cute, young adult book. And I came in third in his contest. Oh, wow. And, and that led to that first gig at Random House. And so okay. I really, <laughs> I owe my career to Pat and Scott. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, I went to the APAC conference, the Audiobook Publishers Association conference that year. And they announced, you know, the winners of the contest. And I was scouted by Brilliance, by Laura Grafton at Brilliance Audio, which has been one of my best and most beloved clients for the oh, past wow. five years. So it all just felt like this was a turn that was meant to happen. And while it was happening, I was not, I, my, my voiceover career started to sort of take a back seat because if you have this amount of time to get in this many finished hours and you have 11 auditions, you can do maybe two of them, Yeah, you know? And my husband said to me, honey, play the hot hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I did. And I still do a lot of voiceover, but it's not my primary focus because this has just sort of taken off in such a big way and sort of frankly taken over my life. <laughs> it's interesting the <laughs> distinction you make too between voiceover and audiobook in a, in a very like voiceover being, you know, commercial animation, video game, blah, blah, right. blah, blah, blah. But audiobook definitely being while, <laughs> while it's certainly associated a very, very different marketplace. It is. And it's, it, it's almost like a different paradigm. Hmm. A, a lot of voice actors do audiobooks, but a lot of the publishers want people who are classically trained actors. Mm. You have the vocal stamina, you yes. have the flexibility. Um, I mean, these are long, long sessions um, and you're it. You're doing raw audio, yeah. <laughs> one track, there's no music. Yep. And, you know, you have to be able to deliver every character. You have to be able to deliver every beat. You have to be able to understand the arc of the story and the arc of the scene. And so it, I think you need sort of a combination of, uh, for me anyway, you know, stage work, because I did a lot of musicals and stuff, mm -hmm. um, a lot, you know, combination of stage training and stage work and the voice work. Um, although some people come at it from many different directions. Mm. I have a friend, um, Alison Larkin, who is a published author, mm. and she narrated her own book and said, this is for me. She was also, oh, wow. of course, a very successful actress and comedian. Uh. Um, but, she ended up being a successful narrator. <laughs> so there's a lot of ways to come to it. But I think it really is a different art form. Hmm. It's it's long form narration, but not the way you think of it in terms of like narrating, um, you know, a, a TV history show, or something. Yes. show or something. Yes. Yes. Like that. It's its own art form and its own entity. Um, so I think it, well, it is a good place for, for voiceover talent, you know, voice talent to make a living. You also have to have these other attributes. Mm. Um, and I know that they are looking for, you know, more classically trained actors or more people who are devoted to this craft. Yeah. And fortunately, I was obsessed with the craft and that, you know, <laughs> that art firm. So, you know, it was a good fit yeah. for me. That's great. Yeah. That's so interesting. And, and fascinating to, to make the distinction too about the importance of, of good stage craft and good acting and an understanding of, of the, um, you know, the, the, the elemental sort of narrative that you're invested in of finding yeah. ways to, God, I'm definitely to like flesh it out. Yeah. And have the patience for it. I, 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 you know, I've done a, one, one of the favorite books that I've done was, uh, I did Crooked earlier this year, which is, uh, Richard Nixon meets, <laughs> uh, Lovecraftian, um, sort of intrigue. And wow. it's the, the book is by Austin Grossman and it is uh, a blast and it was on Sounds a lot of great. like, it made like entertainment weekly's hot sheet and, and uh -huh. like a lot of like must must read summer reading. And we did it during the summer and I did the entire thing narrated as Richard Nixon. 
In character? In character. Wow. And then had to do Kissinger and Dwight Eisenhower and Pat and all the other people who would be a John oh, Dean. You, I've heard your, your Kissinger accent, actually. Yeah, have you really? <laughs> I, think Kissinger? You did, I think you did a similar accent in a class. I might have, like, yeah. Oh, I bet he nailed it. Let me do one. like a Kissinger <laughs> sort of a thing. It's not a very common <laughs> choice. I'm like, I'm going uh, to play Jafar, but as Kissinger. That's um, fantastic. But it was, it was so satisfying in particular because mm-hmm. like and i'll feel it too of like there'll be a chunk of copy that's very stop and start stop and start i just can't get a flow going but then when you get a really nice flow and you go for four or five pages uninterrupted without a break or without a stop or without a stumble doesn't it feel great oh my god yeah the satisfaction of that it's is, an accomplishment it's hard it's really really hard yeah. And, uh, well, what's, what's, what's your process? How do you prepare yourself to, let's say you get, you know, it's a, it's a more than likely a 12 and a half hour, 12, 12 and a half, you know, finished hour book and, and you're going to start work on it tomorrow. <laughs> what's, what's, you know, well, what's, well, I mean, first thing I would do is beg for more prep time. <laughs> huh. Um, because you have to read it through first. I yeah. mean, it's, it's, that's non negotiable. Cause, you know, as you know, you could get caught on page 97. He said with his, I don't know, he said with his sexy Latin accent. <laughs> and uh. if you haven't pre read it, you don't know, you know, so, um, you have to, you know, prep it, but I, I tend to prep the books. I used to, you know, sit there. I mean, I've been doing this five years and things have really changed. Everything's on iPad now. Uh-huh. Um, I used to sit there on the couch with my 12 highlighter pens. Yeah. And my hundred pounds of script uh-huh. and, and, um, like mark things up. Now I do it a little more minimally. I noticed that when I was marking, when I was like over marking the script, so I just, became just, too glib. I'm so sorry to interrupt, yeah. but like with, with your marking process. So you have a uh, bunch okay. of highlighters. So, so like, Blue would be the hero. I see. You know, and, and I use like really cliche stuff, right? Blue would be the hero. Pink would be the heroine. Yellow would be the little kid. And then you start layering. You Understood. Know? But I realized that I was becoming too glib, that I would respond to the color instead of the the text. Oh, wow. And like my brain started like going too fast. Yes. And so I pulled back from over prepping the script. And so now a lot of times – um there are people who read like three lines ahead. These are the people who are not, you know, making any mistakes or five or 10 pages because they right. see what's coming a mile away. Right. I am someone who responds to the text as it appears. Uh-huh. So even if I've read the book twice in prep, I still don't always know what's coming in that sentence because it's essentially a cold read. Yeah. You know, I mean, in that moment, you don't know what's coming, what sentence is coming next on the page, even if you prepped it. So, um, so I like to mark – at this point, I'll mark – you know, if it's unclear who's talking, if it's not very well attributed or um, if there's, you know, 12 people in the scene, sometimes I'll, I'll yeah. circle like um, – you know, the, the person's name or, um, I'll circle, uh, he said nasally, you know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, whatever it is, so you know. clues that will help you determine exactly. what that voice is. So you can yeah. align with the author's or vision. She whimpered, you know, mm. you don't want to get to that after and be like, dang, I got to pick it up, you know? Yeah. And so and a lot of times, um, things will change within a scene, just like on a turn on a dime, mm. right? I'll give myself a little heads up or if something gets really intense really quickly, I'll, I'll mark it in the script because even though I have prepped, I'm still not seeing it a mile away. So I like to yeah. give myself a little like, something's coming, something's coming, you know. Yeah. And and there's just a, you know a lot of little things I do that are sort of um, idiosyncratic. They're they're particular to me and how I think and how I respond to the text. So. Sure. I'm sure everybody has their own method. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That, that's that's interesting. I think that's important <laughs> that you. That you do stay rooted in that moment because you're experiencing that text. So something that Fraley said is you're, you're experiencing the text as the audience is. And if you're telegraphing moments in advance, it takes the fun out or, or it's confusing. Why yeah. would you have a, a feeling of a character being ominous when something's not going to happen for a page? I and agree half? with that, except sometimes you do want to set it up. So I just huh. did a romance where. Uh, okay. They're sitting in the, I just did a scene yesterday. Um, they're sitting in the living room and they think they're out of the woods. You know, they're, there's somebody stalking them. They think they're out of the woods. They're having a nice quiet moment in their living room yeah. and boom, uh, you know, rock comes through the window. So, and they, but they think it's a gunshot uh. and everybody hits the floor. So there's a moment, the sentence before where they're all sitting there and they're like, finally, thank God we can relax. And he took her into his arms crash. So 
in some ways, I do want to telegraph it, right? I mm-hmm. give the moment before just a little extra weight yes. and I give it a little bit of a pause uh-huh. so that the audience can catch up that there's a shift. You know, I don't signpost it per se, uh-huh. but I, I allow the change to happen dynamically because otherwise, otherwise it's like, uh, and then she sat down and he took her into his arms. Crash. You know, yeah. you have to kind of... You do set it up a little bit uh-huh. beforehand. So yeah. I don't know. You, it, it's um, it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Always. You're always drawing in one thing and rejecting another. And hmm. It's really um, an intuitive process for me. Yeah. I understand what you mean. Yeah. You really, you feel it is. It's how that story is expressed through your personal experience and how you like stories to be told, but also what's dramatic and what feels right. That is true. And there's a lot of um, sort of discussion and and um, sort, sort of different camps that come up about mm. different styles. I mean, there's what we're calling lately the active read, which is a very kind of, dyna- you know, dynamic read. You know, you're you're not just telling the story like this. You're, you know, there, it's a, a little bit larger. Um, your characters can be a little bit larger. Um I tend to come from the the old school, which is, you know, a little bit more pulled back. But there are people who love the pulled back. There are people who love the active read. I'm a fan of both, depending on the the material. right? Yeah, well, depending on the actor and depending on the material, definitely material. But like I just did a a webinar for the APA, the Audio Publishers Association, Uh and they let me choose who my guests would be. And I chose Catherine Kelgren. And Scott Brick, uh-huh. because each of them comes from uh, the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, Catherine does a more theatrical read. Scott does a little bit more of a subtle read. Yeah. But both of their characters and their narr- narration is very nuanced. And so I thought, how wonderful to be able to get both perspectives. And as a listener, I'm drawn to both of their reads for very different reasons mm. um, and love them equally. Yes. <laughs> you know, but some people will choose one style and stick with it and, and just like have nothing to do with the other. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> but listening is so, I think listening is so, it's like, it's visceral. It gets in your body. It becomes part of your soul. When you're, when you're really invested in listening to an audio book, it, it's um, a very personal thing. You're in that car with that narrator and that author and those characters for a week at a time, or you're yeah. doing your dishes or you're walking around your house with those pe- or you're sitting in front of your computer with those people. And so people are pretty opinionated about it because, you know, if one narrator drives you crazy, you're like, ah, I hate yeah. them. You know, My and wife- if one feeds your soul. You love it. You right. know, my wife has said she will bail on a good book with a bad narrator. But if she Me likes too. the narrator, she'll hang with a book if it's not – the book isn't amazing, but she likes what the what the reader's doing. I have always agreed with that. But as um, the pool of narrators has broadened, yeah. I've had to let go of that. And if I really want to uh-huh. listen to a book by a favorite author and I'm not in love with the narrator – I, I have to just go for it. Otherwise, I'll miss the book because I don't have time to read anymore unless I'm getting paid for it. Right. So, um, you know, I'll walk around the studio with my phone tucked in my bra <laughs> and it on speakerphone. <laughs> Seriously, it's ridiculous. Once it got lost in there, <laughs> I didn't find it for hours. But, you know, like, and, and I, everywhere I drive, I take my audiobooks with me and it's yeah. like with me all the time. Yeah. I'm listening when I'm not recording, you know, as I go through my life. Yeah. But, um, I don't have time to read anymore. So if I want to hear that book, I have to suck it up. And I often find that by the end of the book, the narrator has actually done a good job hmm. and that I've judged too soon and that over time, I will let go of my preconceived notions of how it should be and accept what they're offering, the gift that they're giving, and let go and have a really good time. <laughs> That's a great point because you – yeah, you're right. I, I've, I've had that on a couple occasions. I don't listen as frequently as I should to audiobooks. I listen more to – I don't know, a, a variety of other things. We well, listen but to podcasts. I listen sure. to podcasts to, to I listen to a actual lot of music, actual music, <laughs> a lot of soundtracks. Yeah. I've been listening to a lot of Oingo Boingo lately. Really? Yeah. I don't know. It's crazy, but like I've, I've 
kind of had a little bit of a man crush on Danny Elfman ever since we went wow. to the, the <laughs> Nightmare Before Christmas live at the Hollywood Bowl on Halloween night. That's fantastic. And then I've been listening to nothing but Oingo Boingo for weeks. I'm just, wow. I'm switching over now. I'm in the process now. It's the Hateful Eight soundtrack, but that's, that's new. That's fantastic. But, um, but I, I, I the, the, a lot of the books I listened to were, um, were authors or celebrities telling their story mm-hmm. and then self narrating, like Craig Ferguson's Accident uh, oh, American on Purpose. Great. Really great. But my favorite, my favorite was Gene Wilder's. Gene Wilder's Kiss Me Like a Stranger yeah. is, is very well read and a very compelling story and very moving. And, and he does something in the book, um, that, that, I've done a lot. And I think we all have at different points where he says at different points, if I hadn't have made this choice at this point, I never would have met Anne Bancroft and she would have never introduced me to Mel Brooks and I never would have made this and I never would have made Blazing Saddles. Wow. So, but it's on this chance encounter with Zero Mostel or, or the choice to go to this school versus that. And he does that multiple times. So it's kind of a running theme throughout the book. Uh, and it's a really beautiful book and beautiful story about him and Gilda, but then all the other people in his life and stuff. Um, but it's, I think it's a, a, listening to Scott. And the, the first time I really listened to Scott was, Scott um, Brick. Scott Brick. Yes. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the devil in the white city, uh, which was, uh, I haven't heard that one. it's a nonfiction about the, um, the world's fair in Chicago in 1893. Ooh. 1985, I forget exactly when, but like the invention of the Ferris wheel. 1895. 1895. <laughs> uh, my dates are so wrong. That's uh, we, I listened to it driving out here. Wouldn't it be great if we still had those? Oh my God. Uh. The World's Fair was incredible. Mm. But the story is concurrent with the story of one of the most notorious serial killers in the history of this country, a guy named H.H. H. Holmes. And they are making a film of that story. And it happened at the same time in the same city. Wow. So it jumps back and forth. So between, the author marries those two yes, stories. Yeah. And how without the world's fair happening, that guy would not have been able to do what he did. Oh, because the city was flooded, the with, city people. Was flooded with people. People was and distracted. He had gr- the police yeah. were distracted. Yeah. And Scott's story, uh, wow. Scott's reading of it is really fascinating and compelling. And to have that sense too of what you're talking about of like, of the sort of the subtle. Yeah. Uh, uh, delivery of it. Um, I'll never forget. I used to be an event coordinator for a catering company. And I remember mm -hmm. walking into the kitchen one day and um, the entire kitchen staff was silent. I walked into like a a silent kitchen and I was like, and, and I heard, the mellifluous tones of Scott Brick. And I said, that's Scott Brick. That's my friend. And they were like, you know him? And then they were like, wait, that wasn't the author? And he was huh. reading, I think it was Michael Pollan, I believe was the author. It was, you know, a culinary book. Okay. And a really famous one. I can't remember what it was. And they were all listening. They they were convinced he was the author. Uh-huh. And they he actually managed to make an entire kitchen staff be quiet. That's amazing. <laughs> it was like the most wonderful moment experiencing the power of a great narrator and the power of audiobooks. Yeah. It was wonderful. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, the idea of a book being able to be a shared experience as a group. Yeah. You know, it was it very makes different. It possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you approach a fiction versus a nonfiction book? Do you do much nonfiction? I don't accept nonfiction books. That's oh, really? I well, no. I mean, I'll, I do <laughs> memoirs, mm. but... um. No, I, I try not to do nonfiction. There have been a couple of books lately that I've taken just because I really, I thought they were worthy and I really liked them. And yeah. I, I wanted the meat and potatoes of the book and yeah. I liked the person publishing it. And, and so I made an exception, but typically my, you know, I, I, I know a lot of people don't feel this way, mm-hmm. but I feel like if there's something that I can knock out of the park every time, that's what I want to do every day. Mm. I don't, I don't necessarily need to do something that isn't as easy or fun for me. I understand. And so for me, if I can do, I love lighthearted romance uh-huh. and I love narrating it too, you know, and, and I love um, middle grade and young adult books. And so if I could just have a steady diet of that every day, I would be totally happy. Yeah. <laughs> and so that, unfortunately, that's what most people give me. I do a lot of mysteries too, and I listen to a lot of mysteries. So mm. I love them as well. But I just think, you know, I think... 
we weren't all put on this earth to be ice skaters and astrophysicists. So why do we need to be? You know, like, yeah. this is what I do well. If you can call your shots <laughs> you and know? do what you want to do, absolutely. <laughs> so I think that's yeah. great. Yeah. I think that's really, really great. <laughs> I, I've, it's, I've found that I get a, a combination. I, I'm, I'm sort of like, uh, in the, <laughs> This is the image that's coming to me. Maybe I'm out of my mind, but I'm a wood chipper when it comes to, <laughs> to audiobook. That if it comes to me, I'll do it. It's well, kind of like yeah. if, if this is what it is. Oh, okay. You want me to read this? Sure. Okay. No problem. I've been doing some stuff with uh, with with Dennis Cow over at, at uh, oh, yeah. Illumin- uh not Illuminati, for Hachette? Literati. Yeah, for Hachette. Yeah. That was who I did uh, Crooked for, and I'm doing a book right now, actually. Um, that's great. Called Free Refills. That's really dynamic. Yeah, he's but wonderful, and, yeah. and they have wonderful books. Oh man. Yeah, really, really amazing. That's great. Yeah, it's 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 been so fun. A wood chipper. <laughs> Just stick it in and I'll grind it out. <laughs> but I, I do think that my approach might not be everyone's and, and it's really hard in this you know, in this work just as in voiceover, you can't really be a specialist. Hmm. But you know, you have to take whatever whatever comes. It's if you say no, you may not work again. And so, you know, I think that's the fear, but I think it's also a reality of the business. Um hmm. so what I've tried to do in my marketing is shape how people see me. Hmm. So I say, you know, if I'm pitching someone or, you know, saying, hey, I've got a hole in my schedule. By the way, I've been doing a lot of romance and young adult lately. Here are my last three reviews and here's an award I just won. Jeez. So, yeah. I mean, it's a way to say to them, I hope you give me more of this. You know, like, yes. like I'm not saying, gosh, I hope I do more nonfiction. <laughs> You know? Right. And so I think there's there's ways that you can subtly ask or tell people who you are and who you want them to see you as. And I, I think that's been, you know, without manipulating them, but saying, this is what I'm good at. This is what other people think I'm good at. Right. I hope you give me more of it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And and so I think that approach has has been successful for me. Give me give me this particular style that you have in your roster or you have coming yeah. down the pipe in your schedule and I'll make it sound amazing. Yeah. And I'm not even really saying give it to me. I'm just saying Saying, here's what what people have thought was good, hmm. and I think in their minds they think, oh well, all right, all right, great, I've got something like that, yeah. you know. And I, I just think it's a it, it's like um, you're not hitting them over the head with it, but you're saying, here's who I am, yeah. And then they start to see you that way, yeah. You know? That's so. great. How do you uh, what, what what do you say to someone who's interested in starting out doing this particular thing? I feel like in some respects. Voiceover as a as a field can be somewhat mysterious to people who want to get into it. But I yeah. but I've encountered both in the teaching that I've done and in conversations with people about it that audiobook in particular seems to be the thing that people would so many wonderful people who are fascinated by love reading would love to do it and have no idea where to begin. Yeah. It's a it's a wonderful group, I will say too. It's um I always used to say that my animation peeps were like the most awesome people in the world. And then you, if you, you have those same people and you add book nerd to the mix, uh-huh. <laughs> you pretty much got a, an awesome group, yeah. you know? And so I think you have to, I think you have to love the art from, I, there are a lot of people doing this who are like, I don't listen to audiobooks. I don't have the time or I don't have the interest. I disagree with that. Mm. Like, I feel like, yes, you can be a wonderful actor and you can show up and you can do it. Of course. But the people I want to hire are, are the people who, you know, who love the medium, who love the mm. art form, who pay attention to what others are doing, who are listening and saying, why is Scott Brooke the best in the world? Mm-hmm. Why is Catherine Kelgren knocking it out of the park every single time? Yeah. What are they doing that is is making people fall madly in love with him and listening to every book that they do? Mm. And 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 that's the way I approach the business, you know. I, I, I analyzed. I took my favorite fifty books and I analyzed what made them good. Who was huh. producing? Who was directing? Uh, what company were they for? Who was narrating? Why? What went? You know what? What made this this alchemy that takes this this book off the page and turns it into its own art form? Yeah. So for me, I want to hire, and I have hired the people who are are paying attention, who care about the art form, who uh, you know. So. But that's, I guess that's advanced and that's getting off topic. That's all right. I want to come, I'm going to come back getting, to that. Okay. If you're just getting started, um, you have to be a good reader. Mm. First and foremost, you have to be a good sight reader. You can't be someone who stumbles over words. It's mm. going to be very hard for you to make a living and it's going to be a, an agonizing, laborious be process. Tedious, yeah. <laughs> but 
that can it, that's easily solved. Hmm. Read to yourself five hours a day. When you make a mistake, correct that mistake. Record it. Listen to where you're going wrong. Hmm. You know, yeah. If you're someone for whom that comes easily, um, then um, I would say take classes because just like everything in voiceover, you want to know what the um, the requirements of this particular medium are. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's some great Dion Institute, Pat Fraley, yeah. um, Vo Dojo. I know I'm forgetting someone. Uh, Radio Ranch does some classes um, uh, over in New York. Um, Peter Burkrott, Johnny Heller. Um, I'm actually going to be teaching up at um, Voice One in San Francisco oh, great. Um, this spring. I've, I've been actually recently asked to do a lot of, of guest teaching, you know, where I'll show up and, and teach for an evening. Yeah. Um, uh, MJ Lalo, um, Mary Lynn Wisner. There's just so many wonderful places that you can go to become educated about the art form. Hmm. But listen, figure out what people are doing. Hmm. Then you make your demos. <clears throat> You're going to make um, like a one to four minute demo of each genre. It's not going to be an amalgam like a voice demo. Yeah. It's going to be, here's my young adult demo, four minutes of me reading a young adult book. You want to, you want to, you know, a man, woman talking or a woman and a child, you know, something compelling. And, and then you, you start sending out to, you know, producers, you want to become a member of the APA, the okay. Audio Publishers Association, audiopub.org. Um, you will get on mailing lists, you'll start to receive newsletters, you'll find out where there's mixers, and you can meet publishers and producers, you want to go to the conference, um, you want a whole page on your website for your audiobooks. Huh. People look, are suspicious of voice talent because they think they're going to get a used car salesman. Yeah. So you want to present yourself in the medium that you want to work in. If you have stage experience, if you have classical training, you want to hit that front and center because um, hmm. that's what people are you know, really looking for. Yeah. And then you start working it. There's also, of course, ACX, which is sort of the backdoor way to get in. Yeah, um, that was actually my way in. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's right. We talked about that back then. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. ACX, I, I went after it. It, it, was, it was on a – I remember – Vividly, it we, we had done Pat Fraley's workshop on audiobooks. Both Sherry and I did it in Chicago uh, right before we moved out here. Maybe well, three that's weeks because right, you were both doing audiobooks. Yeah, and were you directing and engineering each other? Yeah. yeah. Well, basically, I just I just I used to be a director and a producer of industrial film, so like I'm very comfortable editing audio and mixing stuff and like putting a little bit of music on it, just little, little stuff. And right. I'm also, I've also been a big fan of, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just going to go ahead and plow through and see what happens. So it <laughs> aren't was, we all? Aren't we, right, right. Uh, it was Fly by the seat of our pants. Hey man, yeah. make it. And those pants are on fire those and you're pants are on fire, the air. And you're yeah. on fire and you're still like, I'm just, I don't know if what I'm doing is right, but I'm going to do it and I'm yeah. doing it. And all of a sudden you look back and you go, I did that. Yeah. And it and it's okay. It's and I'm about taking risks. That's I think. right. This whole career. This whole career. Yeah. Any, I think any career in particular in the arts. I was just talking about this with John Curry. Like the 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 you know, there is no guarantee in anything. So why not take the risk of doing something that you enjoy doing, that you love, and that you yeah. were meant to do. That's right. Yeah. And tapping into what what it is that speaks to you, but um. It was the 4th of July. We were coming back from Rick Wasserman's house watching the fireworks from – he had rented he had rented a house that uh, Captain and Tennille had lived in up in Malibu. <laughs> and we went up there and nice. it was a, it was our first 4th of July in town. We you were, went all out. <laughs> we went all the way out. We hung out with Rick and Rick and Tamara and the kids and stuff and and came home and I, and I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to jump on ACX and audition for some stuff. Did you get your first audition? I booked three. <laughs> nice. I booked three. <laughs> Three? Yeah. It's fantastic. It was great. The only problem was I didn't have any money to pay a mixer. Right. So I – the first one I did was like <laughs> a nice little three-hour like great little uh, mystery. Oh, that's perfect. By Earl yeah. Der Biggers. Who, Something short. Yes. So I was able to make my mistakes. Yeah. ton of characters and it's still of all the ACX books I've done – I've done two historical romance that have sold like hotcakes, but but of all of them, the the, the ninety nine candles is a pretty 
is a, is a, a, a one of the favorites and high re- re- review and stuff. Out. It's good. It's good. <laughs> yeah. But it's also my very first one. Yeah. So I was like, I, m- I made plenty of mistakes and stuff. And it was, you know, set like 1910 San Francisco and I'm yeah. doing Asian characters in there. And I'm, I'm married to a woman of color. So I'm, I'm very sensitive to being a white man playing different roles. Right. So I'm trying real hard to be respectful, but also be truthful to the character and be truthful to the narrative and all that stuff. Yeah. The time period. Yeah. So did that book and it came together real smooth. And the next two books I did were monsters, probably 13 finished hours. And I was just recording in, in front of my iMac doing my auditions in the morning and then come home and just record and edit. And Sherry booked a book too. So I was cut, I was editing that for her. So like my, so you did the whole thing. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah. So I bought music and did all the stuff and produced it, you know, and they sound wow. great. They sound See, great. It's but a that was totally different paradigm than I came from. Um, I came from the more like traditional, like the first year that I was in it, I would, I was always in a pro studio, um, maybe oh. the first year and a half. So I'd go into random house or they'd fly me out to Michigan and then about Where a in year, Michigan? Uh, Grand Haven. I'm madly. I know in love Grand, with Grand it. Haven. Grand Haven. Uh, I'm going there in like a week and a half for brilliance. Uh, no, my family. I'm from Grand Rapids, so oh like, my gosh, so Grand Haven is my backyard. I tried to persuade my husband to move there, and he wasn't mm. having it. He's like, "I grew up in the snow. I grew up in Brooklyn. We're not doing it." <laughs> but I fell in love with that place. It's it's, it's, it's like heaven, yeah. and you can buy a house for sixty thousand dollars. Yes, you can. Three bedrooms. Yeah. I I'm like what. What are we yep. doing here? I then, record in my own studio now. Why, why would we, you know? Right. <laughs> but, and then go I vacation mean, we have all and our friends City. in LA. And of course, it's wonderful and there's voiceover. But I right. just, there's a part of me that just wants to live there, you know. Anyway, so they'd fly me out to do books. And within a year and a half, the entire industry, at least unless you're in New York City or in Grand Haven, the entire industry had changed and, and, and it really went to, self-recording at home. Uh, now, there are still a lot of studios where you can go out and, you know, they produce books and all of that. Yeah. But a lot of the work has really transitioned to your recording. Now, even with that work, if you're working directly for the publishers, you're not doing any post-production. Right. So you're just sending your raw audio to them and they're doing it. So it's a different world. When I talk to these the ACXers, I'm like, Wait, what do you mean you're, you know, yeah. <laughs> you're proofing your own book, you know? Oh, yeah. And, and, and it's really almost like there's two different camps in the industry now. Mm. There's, it, it, in terms of being an actor in this industry, yes. um, there's the ACX camp and there's the publisher camp. And, and a lot of the ACXers really feel strongly about it. They're like, hey, we can make a living doing this, royalty share and all of that. Yeah. And a lot of them are trying to get into the publisher side. So it's... It, there's there's benefits to each, yeah. but I, I tend to like the publisher side because, well, number one, that's union, yep. though they have the union option at ACX, yeah. but but also there's like a little bit of protection that comes with that. Yes. You know, you're not having to do the post-production yourself and, you know, somebody else is taking care of you and making you sound good. Yes, <laughs> you know that's what I right. mean? So for me, that's like, I love having, I, I feel so lucky that I came up in that time period where I got my start being directed. Yeah. You know, I had, there was an often an engineer and a director, you know, and and I don't know, I think it's gotta be so hard these days coming up having to do all of it yourself. Oh boy. You know, you, you, you're so reliant on, on the, the narrator, I'm sorry, so reliant on the author telling you whether or not you did a good job on their book as an ACXer. Yeah. Uh, and for those of you who are going, ACXer, what's this? It's the oh, audio sorry. book. No, it's okay. I, I, I mean, this is to my way of thinking, this is like a, a prosumer level, uh, conversation okay. where of like, <laughs> we're people who work in this business. Both of us are. And yeah. I, I come to it from the standpoint of the audience of, probably and the, is. And yeah. the audience is a lot yeah. of, a lot of them absolutely are. But, but I'm, I'm, my, I also hope that the audience is, is chock full of folks who are curious about this information. Cause yeah. when I was coming up, this information just wasn't out there. It yeah. It was all inside of the heads of 50 people who wouldn't share it. It's so you know? true. We had to crack that nut. I know. A group of my friends got together and, and you know, we shared information. And we were like, yeah. do you know how to get in touch with Blackstone? You know? Right. <laughs> like, who's the casting? You know, you had to learn it. The, the internet you makes it possible. Do, sort of. A little bit. For the publishing side. Yeah. You have to become. And, you know, a, a lot of people say to me, why should I join the audiobook publishers association. I'm like, because if you want to hang out 
with the guys mm. who drink at the Elks Lodge, you join the Elks Lodge. You know, like <laughs> if you want, if you want access, and there are many member benefits. They're they're manifold. But the bottom line is, if you're going to be a professional in an industry and there is an industry association, you should be a part yeah, of it. Yeah, join it. Right. And then it opens the doors to all this stuff. At a mixer, you're going to meet, the, you know, Grover and Brian, who are the casting directors of Blackstone. You know, oh. you're going to meet them in person yeah. and they're going to get to know you. So there's this whole way, I think, in a way that ACX has created its own business model. But there's over here on the other side, there's the APA and you know, union narrators and producers yeah. and all of that. So there's, I know, a, I, there's no answer there. It's just whatever path that you want to or are able to follow. Some of it's just luck. Yeah. You know, it feels like the, the other part of it too is absolutely not to throw any shade on ACX whatsoever. But when I came into ACX, the volume of narrators matched to authors was shooting fish in a barrel. I could book three books yeah. with a royal, with a stipend and be able to knock it out. Whereas now, if you do a search for stipend titles, you, there's, there's four, you know, narrators to every author or more or more. Yeah. You know, depending on what you're chasing or what your demo is. So like, and the other part of it too is after doing the long work and spending four months, tr you know, apologizing to an author for not getting their book done on time because I'm still trying to finish up the other book and you're still proofing and it. I'm still yeah. proofing it. And, and, yeah. you know, and it's just me. There's no, there's no buffer. It's just me going, yeah. man, I'm so sorry. I can, I, but I can, I can only, there's only so many hours in the day and I got it recorded. I'm on the road and I'm editing your book on my laptop versus Dennis wants you to come in from 10 yeah. to four and just being and his, his team of, Angels will be taking care of they it. They will for be taking you. care yeah. of you and directing you. That there's there's a real value in it. But you know, and that said, I, I I do love the royalty share ability to be like two years after doing a book for Catherine Levesque, still being able to be like, oh, I paid seventy dollars right. this month. I didn't do anything. It's like residuals from commercials, you yeah. know. And that just keeps on going. And to be part of that fan base too is really neat, yeah. you know. So uh, it, it is, it's, it's, it is that sense of like, it's nice to be in one or the other, but if you can be in your own. Yeah. I and mean, a lot of people are merging back and forth as mm. well, you know. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by what you told me when you walked in the room because I didn't know that because you had just about mentioned my about your publishing yeah. company that you've been hiring people. Tell oh, me about. It's so tell wonderful. I love giving people jobs. It makes my heart sing. I, um, I became a publisher this year. Uh, in June, I launched Ideal Audiobooks uh -huh. and it's idealaudiobooks.com if anybody wants to check it out. Awesome. And uh, I D E A L. And, um, it, I, I really started it because the, the name is telling. Because of my ideals about hmm. uh, the kind of books that I wanted to put into the world. I had kind of an epiphany at an airport in Anchorage <laughs> a couple of years ago. It's a good place to have an epiphany. <laughs> I don't have kids. My sister has, has two children that I'm madly in love with. And I was leaving from a trip and they were just so sweet and, and like – wonderful. And I was hugging them goodbye. And I was crying as I went through it. You know, I gave them my ticket and it was, you know, two degrees below zero. And the lady yeah. there was like, you're crying as you're leaving Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> and I went into the bookstore and there was a shelf that was all the, um, the books, booksellers picks. And it was serial killer stories mm. and like bloodlust and like horror and people like ripping each other from limb to limb. Mm -hmm. The sensibility of the booksellers was obviously not mine. Right. But coming off of this sort of pure love for these kids and their sweetness and walking into this bookstore and seeing all this kind of horrible stuff and having played like six serial killers myself the year before, uh -huh. I was like, enough. Mm. Like I need – I need to find a way to put something I, – I, this message, like, came to me, like, you know, from God. No, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. But, it, you know, it just almost – these this specific word wording came to me as I want to bring something wonderful to the world. Hmm. And I didn't know what that – what form that would take, whether it would be my singing or my writing or whatever. Yeah. And two or three years later, I came up with this idea that I needed to become a publisher and I needed to – like control the content and uh, 
put a certain type of book into the world and hire narrators that were worthy and get a union contract and make sure mm. they had their health insurance. Yeah. Just sort of a way to like make things like, to make my corner of the world good. Mm. And what I realized sort of halfway in this process of building it is, oh, the, the specific wording of my revelation was not, I want to make something good or I want to write something good, but I want to bring something mm. good to the world. And I realized that it had nothing to do with something I was specifically creating myself, uh -huh. but bringing authors and narrators together um, and, and, and um, kind of creating something from other people's sources. And I thought, huh, that's kind of oddly specific wording for what yeah. I ended up doing. That so really is. when I decided to do it, though, I didn't want to do it as like, oh, I'm going to self-publish a few books or, you know, like a vanity press or on a small scale. I really wanted to become a publisher. Yeah. I wanted to control the message. I wanted to to create something large and worthy and um, dynamic that would have an influence on the industry and on the world. And so I set out to do it on as large a scale as I could, which meant 25 books for the first year. And we have, we're, we're six months in and we've, we have 16 books on the market. Oh my gosh. Which is so exciting. And it's really, um, our, our slogan is stories with heart. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that whether, you know, we're dealing with books that are that are good, that are quality fiction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're going to have tough stories. You're going to have somebody dying of cancer. You're going to have divorce or, um, you know, other kind of, you know, peril. One of my children's books, um, Absolutely Truly by Heather Vogel Frederick, mm -hmm. it's a middle grade book and I narrated it. Um, mm -hmm. It's about a little girl whose dad lost a limb in Afghanistan mm -hmm. and how the entire world of this family is changed as they have to cope with that loss yeah. because it's the loss of his livelihood. Mm. He was a wrestling coach, you know, in his other life and yeah. um, he, he can't be a soldier anymore. And so their entire world has changed. Mm. And so it's, it's tough stuff, but it's stories told with a sense of hope mm. um, and um, a, a vein of optimism running through it. Um, and, like we have a story, um, Tamara Ireland Stone, a young adult book, um, Every Last Word, mm -hmm. um, is a young woman who is dealing with um, obsess obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, mm. and she's having a rough time. Yeah. And how does she navigate this world? You know, she's like a popular girl in high school. How does she hide this from people? How does she find her truth? And she finds a secret poetry society in the basement of her high school and it <laughs> saves her. <laughs> you know, so, you know. There, there are dark things in these books, yeah. but I don't want to live in the darkness. There's enough darkness in this world. Amen. Like I want to contribute to a sense of positivity or optimism. And I don't mean a blind sense of optimism, but, mm -hmm. but something real and worthy that like puts light into the world. Yeah. And, and I'm hiring narrator. Thank goodness. I, Everybody has said yes. <laughs> and I'm hiring narrators that I just adore personally because we're all a small community yeah. whose work I respect mm. and um, and who – and pairing them with books that I know they can knock out of the park. And it goes back to that whole theory of, of what is your best work? Mm. You know, I, I'm, I'm hiring people for uh, – as a listener and as a fan of their work, yeah. that thing that I know – that they can deliver on beautifully. Mm -hmm. I want to hire them. Other people can hire them for other stuff. I want to hire them for that. Yeah. You know, and so I'm finding books and, and even books like um, uh, my friend Robin Ray Eller. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, professionally, she goes by Robin Eller. Um, I just acquired a book. Uh, we just recorded it, actually. And I directed her um, card called uh, Our Auntie Rosa. Uh -huh. um, and it's the story of Rosa Parks as told by her nieces and nephews. Oh, wow. And, who she helped raise. And um, she was very influential in their lives. So you have the story of this incredible historical figure. Yeah. I mean, arguably the most influential woman in American history. Yeah. And we put her on this pedestal and we say she accomplished this thing. But with, around that are all these other smaller things that she accomplished that contributed to yeah. this big accomplishment right. that speak to her character. Um, other things that grew out of this accomplishment. Hmm. Um, and so there's 
and told from a really loving, wonderful point of view. Yeah. And I knew when I saw this book, it was actually pitched to me by a publisher and, and um, the print publisher. And I said, oh, this is Robin. You know, she has a very sort of intimate, um, sensitive way of narrating. Awesome. And I thought, oh. You know, and, and so sometimes when I see these titles, I think, oh, she has to do this book. Well, you get to wonderful. make that. It's like it's finding that pairing, the perfect pairing of who's the right voice yeah. for this, for this, and to be able to make those choices and assemble that. It's so wonderful. I used to be a casting director, and mm. now I am again. Yeah. And I always loved that. Whenever I would listen to audiobooks, I'd think, oh, man, I'd love to hire Kirby Hayborn to narrate this and such, you know. Uh. And, and And so – and when I would read a book, I'd think, oh, you know, this person would be great at that. And so now I get to to make those choices. And I'm employing, I think I've employed 17 people this year. Oh, my God. That's and phenomenal. I asked for a union contract right up front because I thought this is part of my worldview. Like, okay, yeah. if I'm going to do this, I want to do it right. Yeah. And the union, God bless them, made it possible. Great. So, you know, it was not a hard thing. In And oddly, though though it's hard because I'm still a full-time narrator. Yeah. Um. Wow. I'm, so you're I'm juggling working. your full time yeah. narration schedule plus the. Yeah. Plus and the I've been directing. And I directing. do a lot of, of celebrity, direct a lot of celebrity and author reads. So a lot of times I'll be recording and I'll, I'll be working on ideal in the morning, you know, marketing and, st- yeah. and stuff like that. Um, you know, just juggling. Then I'll go in and I'll narrate. <laughs> yeah. Then I'll direct. And then sometimes I'll go back and narrate from like 10 to 12 at night. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> just to finish up. Yeah. yeah just to finish up. Yeah. It needs to get done. I think, um, I read an article of some successful business women and they said, prepare never to sleep and mm. never to watch an, a single television show again for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank God you're working in storytelling, you yeah. know, where you get to be exposed to these wonderful and unique and, and transformative stories and then yeah. to be able to share them with people too in that way. I feel so amazing. lucky and, and I, I love this transition. Mm. I love all of the pieces of it. I mean, I started directing this year because I was directing for Ideal. And then I thought, huh, I, I like this directing. Maybe I should direct for other people. So I've been huh. directing for other publishers. And it's just, I'm sort of, you know, they always say, or a lot of people are saying nowadays that you have to be a generalist. Huh. You can't just be like, hey, I'm an animation voice actor. Right. And I think in this career of acting in general, as, you know, conglomerates are taking over and the the work is, you know, a lot of voice work is going to celebrities and this and that. Yeah. You really do have to branch out. Yeah. But for me, it wasn't just about branching out for the sake of branching out or for work. It was like an organic identifying of where my heart's truth was, yeah. where my skill set was, mm-hmm. and where I wanted to make a difference. And I... I there's there's this sort of thing that's happened that I, I'd love to share. It's um, having success in one area because I think the place that I've been the most successful is in audiobooks. Like I, I have a fan base. I have, you know, I've won awards. I get reviewed regularly and that yeah. kind of thing. That gave me the confidence huh. to be able to do this other thing. It, it when I When I set out to do these other hard things, I think – well, I accomplished this, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, they took me, you know, yeah. <laughs> I accomplished this. So why couldn't I accomplish that? Yeah. And, and I think there's this idea that I've been thinking about a lot lately, which is you build on your own successes, hmm. whatever they are, you know, you successfully train your dog. <laughs> right. Okay. You have leadership skills, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. you can remember that when you go out to start a business. That's right. You know, there's all these things that sort of marry together and build skills and build confidence to when you're ready to take flight or to leap off the edge of a cliff, Yeah. you know that you'll have wings yeah. to get to the bottom safely, yes. you know, and, or to get to the next plateau. Those, those successes are not as different as they might seem. Correct. That's, that's context. Yeah. Whether you're successful in one thing or another, the point is that you are successful and you have set, you had a, a specific task that you accomplished. And, and, yeah. and I, I totally track with you. You can define your own success. Yeah. You don't have to wait for someone else to define it for you. That's very true. You I know? mean, it, even, even just in terms of acting, I, I learned when I got here to Los Angeles to, in particular with my on-camera career, to define my success differently. I used to define it as I booked that job, but here it's, I got in the room. That's a success. Yes. I got. 
out of out of the seven thousand actors who were submitted for this the 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 twenty spots for this five line co star of those seven thousand, I'm one of the twenty, and I got pinned. I didn't book the job. But I got close. And that may get you a job five years from now because right. that casting director remembers you. That's Do you know right. the Jenna Fisher, that famous Jenna Fisher blog? She's the girl who played Pam on um, oh, yeah. The Office, right? Yes. There was a, a blog post that came. If you if you guys Google listeners out there, <laughs> if you Google um, Jenna Fisher blog acting or whatever, uh-huh. you'll find it. Um, it's I anybody that comes to me and says, "Hey, do you? How do I break into voiceover? How do I break into audiobooks?" I have a little one sheet that you know. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a good idea to have one for a- VO and one for audiobooks. Yeah, the one for VO. I send them a bunch of blog posts. One of them, one of them says, one of them is t- from J.S. Gilbert from San Francisco. Who it's titled "Does the World Need Another Voice Actor?" <laughs> because I think if you read this and you still think the only thing that will make you happy is being a voice actor, okay, go forward. Right. You know, learn to act if you don't know how to act, yes. and, <laughs> and then you know, keep going forward. But the Jenna Fisher blog, I give them to inspire them, and it's exactly mm. what you're saying. Mm. She talks about redefining success in Hollywood and how she'll go home for Christmas and nobody under, they're like, have I seen you on TV? Have I seen you on TV? And she's like, you don't understand that the, the, the pivotal point of the last year for me was getting a second callback for that mm-hmm. commercial or a second callback for that show. Yeah. Like that was life changing. And my actor friends understand what an accomplishment that was, but yes. it's something that the world outside measures differently. Yes. So you almost have to be your own barometer of success. Yes. You know, that's absolutely and true. And your own like fan club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, 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 um, it's, it's really, it's really hard and it's really competitive. Yeah. And, and to make small steps to get to stay confident, to train, to, to pursue it, to, spe- to be here. All those things are part of it. And, and just getting to Hollywood, just is getting hard. to Hollywood is, is I <laughs> Physically spent, moving to Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. I, I spent 30 some odd 40 years trying to get here. Me too. And, uh, you know, like to be there is an accomplishment and, yeah. And a, a, and a privilege. And a privilege mm-hmm. to be part of this community and to be known and, and embraced by it. And it's, it's a joy to be a part of it. And it was a joy to be a part of the Chicago acting community and a joy to and be San a part Francisco, of the, yeah. and San Francisco and Detroit for me and Cleveland, all those communities to be a part of it. I, I, I remember feeling, but it's, it is that thing that I tell folks who come here, like getting here is an accomplishment, but it's, it's level one. And if you, you can't, you use it to propel you forward. But if you live, I have like I, a friend who, you know, I, I've known lots of folks. I teach at Second City. So I see a lot of folks come in who are really gung ho to be here. And other folks are like, I made it. And now I'm going to coast because it's LA and it'll come to me. <laughs> like, oh, buddy, you just, you just broke the topsoil. You broke the topsoil. You still got to keep digging. There's water yeah. down there, but you got to keep <laughs> digging for it. You just got the sod out the way. And it's a, it's an accomplishment. Yeah. But there's something, there's something in the air here. I remember hmm. when I moved here, people finally understood me. Like I always had, you know, huh. really close friends in San Francisco, but I always felt that people didn't really get me. Like, <laughs> like, they didn't, like people would say to me, why are you still taking classes? You're already yeah. a working actor. And I'd be like, what? And, or they'd say, why don't you just become a community theater actor and work a day job? And I'd be like, no, that's not the point. You know, like yeah. f- since I was, I don't know, five years old, I knew that I wanted to be a working actor yeah, and that I wanted to be at the top of my game yeah, and, and that I wanted to be doing the work that I love and I wanted to be paid for it. And, and those other paths may be okay for some, but that was the, that has been the driving force in my life and I've given up a lot for it, Yes, you know? And, um, but when I got to LA, I remember people would just talk to me. They would come up and talk to me. Yeah. This guy who wasn't, who didn't work at Starbucks came and bust my table once. He goes, hey, let me take that for you. I'll throw it away. And I was like, oh, uh, thanks. He goes, you just looked like you'd be happier with a clean table doing your work. And I was like, th-. he was like some like college kid. I was like, thanks. <laughs> and like some other lady came up and talked to me in Gelson's. She just had like a life crisis. She just got off the phone and found that her husband was cheating on her oh, because the other woman had called her. And she just came right up to me and she was like, I need to talk to another woman right now. Huh. And, and just... Stuff like that would happen yeah. everywhere. It was like, 
a community of people just can looking for commonality or looking for yeah. connection. And it really supported this idea that we are all in this together. Like, yes. Like we are a community of creative people with the driving force of our lives is to, to make something wonderful. Yes. And, and we need each other. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's funny. I, I go to these parties and everybody's like networking and part of me says, Oh, look at everybody networking. And part of me says, I, part of me says, we're all looking for connection. Yeah. Some of it is business, but some of it's not. Some of it's looking for that soul connection of people who are making art for a living. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I, I absolutely feel that spirit here and have noticed the nature of my interactions being vastly different than they've been in other cities I've been in. Yeah. And, uh, and I love it. I feel, you know, I, I feel so so much more at home in this town because of that yeah. and and because it is that challenge of 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 all of us being committed to this common to this goal common goal of entertaining yeah. or, or enlightening or creating and sharing it was it was this this is i don't know i'm still been putting it together but we went to go see star wars over the weekend uh, I haven't made it. I'm dying I, no to No spoilers at all. But we walked out of the movie theater and we were going to the car and I see uh, the mega producer Brian Grazer standing there <laughs> with a couple of the people talking, validating their car. And uh, here's what was great about that. Um, mega producer Brian Grazer had to go to the Arclight in Santa Monica to see it too. <laughs> and and that that we are all yeah. – we are all here – coming up, creating, generating to whatever extent that LA, I read some article somewhere that said that LA is a blank canvas and it doesn't care what you create other than it, it invites you to create and that that's our job and that's that LA beautiful. will support whatever you give it. It ain't going to stop you and it ain't going to push you to do it, but it says, give me. And, and that's what we're, and so. I love you know. that. I brought you a quote. I couldn't remember it. Uh, I just put it on Facebook like a couple of days ago. And um, uh, it was the that Joseph Campbell quote. Oh. That famous Joseph Campbell quote, follow your bliss. Yeah. But there's a, there's a corollary. Do you know the corollary? No, I don't. Well, of course, now Facebook won't come up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Reestablishing lost connection. Uh-huh. Um, the corollary is um, and a door will open where there once was a wall. Huh. I, I'm probably misstating it, but it's it's follow your bliss and it's huh. not just follow your bliss. Follow your bliss. Oh, it was in the universe. And the universe will open a door where there was once a wall. Huh. And 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 I think that's what we're all doing. You know? Yeah. So I guess huh. there's a reason I don't live in Grand Haven. <laughs> Much as Grand, I love it Grand and want Haven, to be there. <laughs> Grand Haven is wonderful. It's a wonderful supportive community. It is. But but yeah. growing up there, I I also knew that I needed to I needed to leave. I needed to leave. Yeah. And, and, and as much as I love going back and I miss being there, yeah. I, 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 I get antsy when I'm out of LA too long. It's weird. It's a weird thing. But once, yeah. but having known it, I came out here 20 years ago and studied for a bit and then went back and spent the rest of my life trying to get right back in. Wow. Yeah. yeah it's like it, these are your people. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You're my people. It's great. Uh -huh. Dude, I could talk to you all day. I'm so <laughs> I know it was so much fun. I'm so thrilled for the success. <laughs> Tell me one more time. Uh, ideal uh, ideal audiobooks. Ideal audiobooks, yeah. and the website is ideal ideal audiobooks dot com. Yeah, and, and we have a Facebook page and a Twitter page, both the same name. Um, and we have a whole bunch of wonderful new books that we're going to be producing all year. So wonderful. Check it out. And people can follow you on Twitter. How? Uh, either at Amy Rubinate, A M Y R U B I N A T E, um, or Ideal Audiobooks. Awesome. Yeah. Oh man, Amy, what a what a blessing to have you in here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. You bet. This has been All Over VoiceOver with Kiff VH. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and give us a positive rating. It truly helps. Follow me on Twitter at Kiff VH or on Instagram at Kiff VH or on Vero at Kiff VH. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you soon. Claim victory and depart the field. Werewolf? Yeah.